we had a session on the viability project this morning with uh, I think eight presentations from contributing scientists and after methods anyway that we could do better than that uh, and the key the key results seem to be that you know maybe it is maybe it isn't viable we couldn't really tell and we knew that anyway so I I I, I think actually that position is sort of a little bit a little bit unhelpful and what we're going to do now in this is do what we were asked of a quick overview of the project because some of the audience is different from the audience that was here this morning and then we will very rapidly run through some of the key results that are emerging and i believe these things are uh new they're they're they are potentially important um and real real uh, useful outputs from the project so far and as you'll see this this is only the beginning so uh, a little reminder from uh, those that weren't in the for those who weren't in the morning uh, meeting. This is a project set up to better understand the socio socioeconomic viability of agroecological practices and their livelihood system impacts across environmental and demographic gradients in Africa, looking in particular income and production, labor and work patterns, the lock-ins and drivers that. Uh, help or or provide uh, give barriers to uh, to prevent people using these things and and what does this have in uh, you know, the environmental uh, concerns in this? It's based on case studies. There are eleven case studies in eight different countries. I think a total of twenty one sites. Some of the case studies are, are in multiple sites, and the whole thing has been supported by the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and the methods that we've used is one of trying to uh, pro provide a common framework that can be used across these enormously diverse uh, sites and cases, uh, yet uh, so that we can do some integration and cross-case analyses and yet which are ad adaptable and uh, to those those different situations um and we we talk about the steps step one one two three four etc step one was about using secondary data to sort of characterize the, the context of each place uh, and we've assembled that data for those 21 sites from 11 case studies then there was a stage of using key informant interviews to understand the status of agroecology and use of agroecological practices in each of those sites. And there are 200 and something interviews recorded. Then there was a farm uh, and farm household survey step uh, set up to understand the farm structures and ecological practices and uh, try and see whether we can find some common patterns in relationships between those. And there's some 5,000 farms were surveyed. Then there were a series of focus groups, discussions, which were particularly looking at those drivers and lock-ins of use of agroecological practices. Um, and there are 85 of those in the common uh, data um, uh, database framework. And then finally, some more detailed studies looking particularly at work and labor and using a, a participatory cost benefit analysis to try and get a handle on the, the multiple factors and trade-offs that people are using when they're deciding uh, whether or not to use agroecological practices. So the what's been going on is um, analysis and reporting of data from each case study is by the case study team and you you saw a few of those this morning uh, it was only a selection this morning we didn't have time to invite all the teams to present we're then doing cross these cross case analyses uh, by different groups who are focusing on different aspects and you heard from Pierre Girard this morning who was talking about the, the structural analysis you heard from uh, Benoit uh, this morning also and you heard from uh, Sydney talked about the uh, narrative analysis that was based on the key informant interviews. Um, <clears throat> and 
this analysis of, well, the data, there's actually data compilation is still going on, it's still in process, and most of that cross case and the, the individual case analysis and publication is still going on. In December, uh, we had a, uh, a, a results meeting uh, here in, in Montpellier hosted by Sirad. And at that meeting, we, although these were these were preliminary results and most of the cross case analyses hadn't been done, we felt that there were some strong messages coming out of the project already. And at the results meeting, we sat down and wrote, we wrote down, what do we, what do we feel um, are the, the big messages which are coming out? And we then wrote that up and it's just come out as a working paper. Um, this, this, this one here, um, it's, it's, it will be online well, as soon as Fabio gets a minute away from this meeting, actually, it's it's kind of there, but there were a few a few little details of the of the paper that needed needed uh, uh, finalizing, and then it will be available. And so, what we're going to do in in this session now is just is just to highlight not not all, but some of the key messages which are coming out from there. Before that, we were asked to say what's going to happen next, 2023 and beyond. So we're going to wrap up the, the data collation. We're going to uh, analyze the, the fin try and wrap up the analysis and publication of each cases. There are some of those out already. There are some papers published already. So one from Ethiopia, for example, is a paper is already published. Uh, others are, are in, in the process. So one from Burkina Faso uh, that Michelle presented this morning, that's, that's, uh, that's just under, under review by the journal. And then the cross-case analysis, we have a process by which people involved in any way in the project can propose themes for cross-case analyses, get other people to engage in that, uh, do the analysis, write them up and publish them. And there are currently in the system, there are 10 of those in process. Whether they all you know, reach the finishing line, uh, we, we don't know, but we'll do everything we can to make sure that happens. And the target is that we would have a, a like a final results meeting in December of this year when all that will have been will have been wrapped up and we hope most of it published by then as well. All right, so the the key messages now I'm going to uh, Nadine, who has been uh, coordinating the project uh, from the Sirad side, is going to go through the um, the first. I forget how many key messages, and then the last couple I will I will take over and and wrap up. So, Nadine, I'm going to hand this over to you. Okay. I think we'll I'll I'll advance the slides when you tell me to. Okay. okay. Great. Next slide, please. So one of the key message we we identified based on the what has been presented this morning is that uh, agroecological practices are used widely and are diverse. If you look at the graphics on the left, you can see that it depends on the country. In some countries, you have more agroecological practices used than, than in other contexts. But uh, what is common is that uh, farmers are using generally more than only one practice. So it's related also to the discussion we had this morning. And uh, this uh, looking at the link between these practices and the IHLPE principles, we can see that many of these practices are addressing the, the first two principles of input reduction and soil health. It is really based on the fact that we, we made emphasis on the farm and household scales and that uh, broader scales were not addressed directly in this project. But uh, th this practice is a same practice, of course, can be related to, to various principles. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, here, what is important to, to, to note is that uh, practices are used in many combinations that contribute to changing farming systems. We had also this discussion this morning that uh, practices, in fact, are combined at farm and household skills and even at, at broader skills. 
and uh, that generally applying uh, these practices need a redesign of the farm of, of the, the farming systems. So uh, the, the combinations depend on, on the sites. For example, in Tanzania, you had specific combinations of, of practices that were different from the ones that we identified in Ethiopia. Next slide, please. Agroecological practices used have multiple origins. Um, we've seen also this point this morning where uh, the practices uh, and uh, that we, we analyzed in this project were in some cases coming from uh, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge of, of farmers and communities, whereas in other cases they were co-developed, uh, mixing this uh, uh, traditional knowledge with the one coming from uh, scientists or, or, or technical advisors. And in other cases, uh, these practices were fully introduced. Um, and this is a case, for example, of uh, the agroforestry with exotic tree or pure pesticide found in, in some cases. Uh, Co-development of, of practices mixing uh, this traditional knowledge with uh, scientific knowledge is one key principle of, of, um, of agroecology. And in most of the cases, we've seen such a such combination of, of knowledge. Next slide, please. What was important uh, to notice in, 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 uh, in this work is that farmers were using uh, these uh, agroecological practices despite unsupportive regimes. Here we have some example of statements from key informants uh, that highlight the, the unsupportive role of uh, um, private sector or even uh, public policies, but also um, of um, uh, including scientists in some cases that uh, were not uh, or were promoting alternative modes of productions. But what can be said is that in, in some cases we can see emerging um, um, positive public policies, such as in Senegal or in Burkina Faso, where they, they, they are now trying to support the, uh, not only um, synthetic fertilizers, but also um, uh, compost or other source of uh, organic manure uh, at, farm, at farm scale. Next slide. This figure has been uh, presented this morning here. Uh, what is important to, to note is that different farm types use different combination of agroecological practices here. Uh, as uh, presented by Pierre, uh, we've done a multifactorial analysis combined with a cluster analysis on the 5,000 data uh, uh, surveyed farms in order to see um, links between structural characteristics and uh, agroecological practices. It was not always easy to find simple uh, trends between uh, uh, structural characteristics and, and practices. However, uh, what is important here is that uh, smallholder farmers uh, are not always the one using uh, agroecological practices. In many cases, it was in fact the farmers that were able to uh, use their um, social assets or te technical assets to implement these uh, agroecological practices. Next slide, please. Um, an important key message from this project is that farmers use agroecological practices for a wide diversity of reasons. Uh, of course, it's changed from one site to another, and uh, increased yield is one of the, the, the important reasons for, for using these practices. This is also related to the uh, principles we've seen at the beginning, where, where uh, decreasing uh, inputs and also soil health were, were one of the important principles observed in the site. However, uh, we see that uh, environmental uh, reasons and also social reasons are also uh, uh, mentioned by, by farmers uh, as a reason for implementing uh, these practices. And it's important in this assessment of agroecological practice to also include the, these dimensions. 
Next slide, please. An important uh, key message that we wanted also to share with you uh, is that uh, labor is uh, not always a barrier to use agroecological practice. This has been um, presented uh, by Rachel this morning, but also by Benoit, that um, um, sometimes, uh, even if labor was an important constraint in various sites, uh, uh, it was sometimes also uh, implementing agroecological practices was also an opportunity to reduce the time needed to, to work, to earn income, to, be, to buy inputs. And uh, what we've seen also is that farmers are in fact um, balancing trade-offs between uh, various um, benefits, environmental benefits, social benefits. And in, in many cases there are um, they, they are okay to implement more labor because they also consider these other economic, and social, and environmental factors. Also, uh, what we've seen is that uh, wage labor is a means of dividing agricultural incomes between uh, smallholder farmers um, where you have an employed family worker that can work on bigger farms that need more investment in terms of labor. Also, as mentioned by, by Benoit this morning, there are gender differentiated effects linked to the division of tasks between men and women. And promoting some practices may have uh, effect positive or not on, on, on women or, or younger, younger uh, worker at the farm scale. So thank you. Um, Rick, can you go ahead? Final two things. We did have a key message about about methods um, and this feeling that you know, assessing the viability of agroecological practices or assessing agroecology more generally is certainly complex. So people pointed these out this morning. Practices are not used on their own. They don't work on their own. They're used in in all sorts of different combinations. These things interact with each other. Um, Secondly, agroecology is about shifting systems and that can't actually be reduced to changing in practices. There are other things in a system as well as just the, the, the farm level practices. Viability depends on the regime and context beyond the farm. So to say, is this practice or even this set of practice or even the system viable, you have to say where it's situated and what's going on around it, what's supporting it and what's blocking it. Viability isn't something that uh, exists as a as a as a separate sort of out of context property of a of a practice or group of practices. Opinions and points of view matter. It's not only about net metrics and indicators. Many of the the we uh, didn't show data on this sort of cost benefit analysis, but when you look there, you think. The, the 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 way farmers are reaching conclusions about these are often based on their own feelings and two farmers immediate neighbors who who are experiencing exactly the same thing in terms of the metrics come to completely different conclusions about the viability of it uh, understanding directions and drivers and system they change needs longitudinal data and uh, there's limits to what you can do with single time points and all the concepts and definitions that we use, starting with what we mean by agro, uh, uh, by agroecology, are contested and they are evolving. And I think actually one of the, I hope that one of the outputs from this project will be, we, we actually advance that a little bit and we'll, we'll come up with another iteration of what some of these are. To my mind, none of these things invalidate the findings that we have got already. Um, and the final one I, want, I wanted to put up again, what I think is, is, is really important message, and that is the one that Sydney presented this morning about these alternative narratives of what agroecology is, what it means for Africa. These things, uh, uh, Sydney reported them, I'm, I'm stating them here maybe in a, in a slightly different way. This was based on the analysis of that key informant data, where these three uh, visions of what agroecology is about. Uh, one is that it's it's 
keeps current systems where they are. It's for poor people and it may be a poverty trap. The second is it's shift, it's, it's provides tools which are part of an, a, a more extensive toolbox, which help farmers move to more intensified production. That is move up on the, the production or uh, ec economy scale there. But the third one is the one that says, agroecology is a vision of a more uh, holistic system that not only improves production, economic benefits and welfare, but at the same time provides those social benefits, uh, maintains, improves ecosystem integrity locally and globally. And the, the, the vision of agroecology as, as, as what it is to do that um, is, is the third one. Um, and I think quite a lot of the variability in uh, the way people are assessing and talking about agroecology comes down to the fact that they see agroecology is, is contributing in these different ways. So I think these, these narratives, and these weren't the only three that, uh, that they identified from there, there were, there were more, but these are the most important ones. Um, I think these are important for providing insights into the, the current results. For predicting future trajectories, there's, a, there's all the difference in the world between number two and number three when things change. If, for example, fertilizer suddenly becomes cheaper again, if you're, an, if you're a number two agroecologist, you'll, you'll just go out there and buy the fertilizer and forget about all the work of composting. Whereas if you're a number three type agroecologist, even when you can afford fertilizer, you might decide that you should keep on recycling and, and being synergistic, et cetera. Um, and they also, of course, have, have uh, big implications for designing strategies and interventions. I think we need interventions and strategies which are going to help more people become type three agroecologists. <laughs>